Hi, I'm Jen Rogers at NASDAQ Market Site, and this is Breakthrough Economy. Today, we explore the promising advancements in gene editing, examining key innovations in the space, and exploring how this is changing the face of medicine and beyond. I'm joined by John Leonard, CEO of Intellia, and Rodolf Barangu, distinguished professor at NC State and co-founder of Intellia. Thank you both so much for joining us. John, I want to start with you and talk about this full spectrum approach that Intellia has has right now to gene editing. Can you tell us exactly what that is and why it's different than what other companies are doing? Full spectrum is basically the approach that we're taking. You know, when you think about gene editing, what you're able to do with the CRISPR-Cas systems, it's really very, very broad based. And so what we've tried to do is capture uh, as much of that horizon as we can. So we think about use cases that fall into an in vivo setting Think of that as fixing broken genes where you take the technology into the body. And then there's uh, examples where you take cells outside the body, manipulate them, that's the ex vivo side. So in vivo, ex vivo. And then the third leg of that, of this full spectrum approach, is building a platform so that we continue to evolve and grow what the uh, CRISPR-Cas system is, is actually able to do. So what are some of the potential advancements that we could see in both of these areas, the, the full spectrum, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, when we think about genome editing, what it's really allowing us to do is go beyond where traditional modalities have reached their limits. So think about small molecules, antibiotics, things like that, or antibodies, they're able to go after certain disease states. But there's certain conditions that where you need to go to the source, which is the gene itself. And so when we think about a genome editing, there's a series of different disorders that are gene based that you actually have to go and manipulate that DNA itself. So that's an area that's opened up with genome editing and CRISPR is ideally suited for that. And on the ex vivo side, there's times when you want to engineer cells so that they're able to do different things than what they would do naturally. So if you can rewire a cell, you can have you know, cells of the immune system go and find cancers that normal cells otherwise wouldn't be able to do, for example. So I think I mean, bringing up cancer, I mean, that's been so many of the headlines that we've seen out there. Uh, what, what are some of the potentials for this technology? I would argue that the only limitation that we have is our imagination. This technology is amazingly powerful. And in the past 10 years, uh, an army of CRISPR scientists has been able to develop, engineer, design, and advance and build a whole toolbox that enables us to not just change one base in one gene, in one sequence, in one cell, but do that scalably. And we can now change multiple locations, multiple loci, in multiple genes, in multiple cells, in all kinds of organisms. And we now virtually have the ability to not just change, not just edit, but actually rewrite the genome, the transcriptome, and the epigenome of any cell in any organism on planet Earth. So the possibilities are unbelievable, exciting, mesmerizing, daunting <laughs> from a scientific standpoint and from a business standpoint, from a therapeutic standpoint, from a biotechnological standpoint. And um, we can unleash a technology in ways that people can't even imagine today. So imagination is the limit. But you're, this is a business, right? I mean, you guys are trying to bring products to market. What, what's going to be first? What are we going, and, and how, when are we going to start seeing this? Well, first of all, I would completely agree with what Rodolfo was saying. I mean, the, the, the possibilities really are limitless, given enough time and resources and learning along the way. But uh, as a company that, you know, is trying to make new medicines, we look for problems that are ideally suited for the technology, where we have insights that we could deploy today to get to products that are you know, readily addressable. And by that, I mean you know, available in the next few years. And so we start with triaging those things that we think the technology is well suited for, that we know how to go about it. There's a regulatory pathway that we can pursue so that you know, in a standard sort of FDA type process, et cetera, the regulators and physicians, et cetera, will be familiar with what we're trying to do and understand the utility of the product. To go back to imagination being the, <laughs> the limit here, I mean, it also carries this, this kind of innovation, lots of ethical questions 
and considerations as well as regulatory ones. So how do you see those challenges given the almost the, the limitlessness of this technology? So what's interesting, right, is that this is disruptive innovation. It's great because it's innovative, but it's challenging because by nature it's disruptive. We're able to do things that sometimes we're not ready for. We're able now to do things that maybe regulatory guidelines and ethical frameworks haven't considered as possibility. So there's a little bit of a gap of a delay between our technical ability to do something, change human cells, change the human genome, therapeutically and beyond, but also understand how we should do that responsibly, transparently, ethically, and in a way that we communicate and explain to regulators and the public and the media <laughs> and the business community of how we're gonna do so in an ethical manner. So how do you approach these questions you know, as the head of the company and closing that gap that Rodolfo was talking about? Well, CRISPR is certainly broad-based in the sense that it can be used for any DNA sequence in any living form, right? But we're a company focused on therapeutics. We make medicine for patients. And so just as any company that tries to make medicine with other approaches, you kind of think of the standard sorts of medicines that people take today, the same principles apply. It's just that we have tools that are able to go after certain problems that have been unsolved. And so, you know, well, we as members of the broader scientific community think about some of these other uses. For us, it's about expanding the pharmacopoeia and having solutions for unsolved medical problems. And that's where we draw the line. I mean, it's, it's you know, we, we work on problems that we think are meaningful to patients. We conduct clinical trials exactly the way that they would be done by any other, whether an academic setting or a pharmaceutical setting, it's done exactly the same way. We're subject to the same regulations. There's nothing special in that sense. It's medicine. But uh, like many technologies, you can think about chemistry and making small molecules. You can think about biologics and what, how they might be applied. Outside of that domain, there's lots of other use cases, but we live in the world of therapeutics. So for people that um, suffer from these diseases or are caregivers for people, they want these treatments yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, I was reading somewhere that um, you had said that some of the things that are being worked on today, not in Telia specific, but just in the gene editing CRISPR space, won't actually fully come into fruition until 2046. I mean, that's like <laughs> Buck Rogers time. I'd have to date myself. But why, why so long, 2046? So I think, I think some things that we do have to have very long-term ramifications. If you think of big problems that are outside of therapeutics, think of like global warming, right? If we want to use and deploy CRISPR-based gene editing modalities to change the DNA, not of human, maybe not even of crops or livestock, but trees to breed a more sustainable forest, whether it's disease, whether it's water usage, whether it's temperature resistance, whether it's drought resistance, or whether it's the ability to capture carbon, we have to have the wisdom and the ambition to think long-term. And you have to stratify, stratify, you have to strategize, you have to rank hierarchically how much you're gonna bet on short-term, lower hanging fruits, how much you're gonna bet on midterm, a little bit more ambitious, but also make sure that you invest some of your resources, some of your energy, some of that technology, some of that attention into things that will take maybe decades to address. I, I would emphasize as a therapeutics company, we probably have about a five year horizon as we think about, but that makes sense. I mean, you know, obviously we're talking about the many, many uses, you know, starting therapeutics and thinking more broadly about other life forms. But for the sorts of problems that we work on, there's things you can do in the laboratory that give you a good sense of what's going to happen in a patient. And you try to do as much of that work to validate the next step, you know, in, in actually going to patients. And so most of the things that we, we work on probably have a five-year horizon. And it's, it's certainly true that, you know, as Rodolfo points out, that we're gonna learn a lot as we go. And so you can think about the use cases expanding as we go, but uh, we think more in terms of five-year intervals, you know, at, at companies like Intellia. 
in the next five years, do you think that we will see revolutionary therapeutics hit the market, either from Intellia or, or other companies that will really change the field of medicine? I think it's already in the cards. You know, and I'll speak more broadly for the field. You know, obviously we're proud of the work that we're doing in Telia and we're working on certain conditions, amyloidosis, uh, an unusual or not very common disease called hereditary angioedema where patients can have spontaneous swelling and die as a result of that. It's gene-based and you can approach that, certain things in cancer. But we've seen the work that others are doing. We already know that you can cure sickle cell disease, for example and uh, other companies are working in the space. We think you can revolutionize that even further in terms of how you bring the modality to patients. But we know from a genome editing point of view that you can take something that you, you know, we had very little offer patients in the past and it was, had incredible amount of suffering and you know, just took a terrible toll for patients and the healthcare system. We've now seen multiple examples where those patients are cured indistinguishable almost from people who are, you know, don't have sickle cell disease. And that's just the start of what's gonna happen. So the revolution is here. And the only question is how far and how broad based will it be? I mean, absolutely on, on that note, right? If you think of time, it's very hard, if not foolish, to try to predict the future. We can use our knowledge to forecast. And if you look at where we are today, the data, the technology, the investments, the resources, the proof of concept, the papers, the patents, the preclinical data, the clinical data, you can confidently forecast that in short term, we're gonna get there. And we can be aggressive to some extent, depending on what specific disease, what specific patient population, what specific indication, what specific modality, what specific tissue. But there is such momentum at this very point in time that if you forecast over time where we're headed right now, with a very high level of confidence, we can be very bullish on what's next. That's great. It means we'll be able to have another conversation in 2046. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I'll look the same. John Leonard, CEO of Intellia, Rhoda Barangu, distinguished professor at NC State and co-founder of Intellia. Thank you guys so much for coming and talking to us. Thank you. Thank you for having us.